All right, so let me uh, look at this question. So I think I have uh, uh, done this question before, but I didn't completely finish it. So, uh, so let me just do this one just from start to the end, uh, just to completely. <laughs> so it says, calculate the rotational kinetic energy of some mass motorcycle wheel if its angular velocity is okay we are given the angular velocity and it's oh i see inner radius let me label this r1 and outer radius this r2 so if you're thinking of a motorcycle wheel it's a geometry then i hope you have this image in mind of some circular disc like object and uh, it's not a it's not just a ring and it's also not a solid disc. It's a, uh, it's a donut, which is why they are giving you two set of uh, radii, or a set of two radii. So this is my inner radius, R1, and this is the outer radius, R2. And looking at it, so in this question, they didn't give you the a rotational inertia. So rotational inertia is one of the things that you will have to find in the course of answering a question like this. And they are asking for rotational kinetic energy. I think I have the formula, formula memorized for uh, kinetic energy and, or the, from having the translation of kinetic energy memorized, which is uh, one half mass times velocity squared. I can guess from the analogy that rotational kinetic energy will be one half times the rotational analogy of mass, rotational inertia, times the rotational analogy of velocity, rot angular velocity squared. So uh, since they're giving us the angular velocity, really the only thing I need is the rotational inertia. So that's the, uh, the crux of this question. So when you have to, uh, work with the rotational inertia, you are always, always of course, welcome to look up the um, textbook for uh, for <laughs> what uh, rotational uh, inertia for the particular geometry is. And um, I, in the lecture, I did go over uh, driving rotational inertia for certain particular geometries. In general, I would say, you know, feel free to look it up from the textbook. Um, well, first of all, know where to look it up from. I think it's in, under fixed axis rotation. And um, I think it's going to be under calculating moments of inertia. So let's. Scroll down and see the method yeah, which we covered in lecture. And uh, using these methods, you can do they have the table, table, table? No. All right. It's in the other section. Um, 10.4. Uh, moments of inertia and rotational. That, uh, sorry, it just doesn't make too much sense to me. Um, so they gave you this a table of uh, rotation inertia and then told you how to drive it. Uh, which, all right. Now, as you look at this table, uh, you are going to... Oh, so in this particular case, I guess you could use this rotational inertia. So um, uh, that wasn't the way I was going to go, but you know what? That is in the textbook. You are welcome to use it. So this is the formula for rotational inertia for the kind of object that's described in this question, which is it's like a disk. So if it had been disk, you would have been looking at uh, this formula here. Uh, you know, solid cylinder except the height is very thin, so that it's just a disk for this axis. That height doesn't matter anyway. Um, um, so it's like a disk, except you have a center hollowed out. So you know, if you want to use this formula, let me just quickly work out the answer, see what the answer is, and then I will do it one more time the long way, and just to verify that the long way, which I think is conceptually more grounded, uh, gives you uh, the same answer, the same correct answer. So with all these things I have looked up, this is what I can do. I can say, all right, let me declare some variables I'm gonna use for number plugging in exercise. 
I need my mass, um, my, my omega. I think that's everything I need, yeah. So my kinetic energy, oops, kinetic energy is going to be one half times uh, rotational inertia, which comes from this formula, mass divided by two uh, times R1 squared plus R2 squared times uh, omega squared. So that's my kinetic energy. And to get the numerical value to plug in, I use the substitution syntax to plug in the numbers. My, um, my mass is uh, 10 kilograms. I'm just going to use basic SI unit. My R1 is uh, 0.28 meters. My R2 is 0.33 meters. And if you are worried about these being interchangeable, worries you, don't worry about it for now. Let's see what answer we get. Uh, I need omega. Omega is, radians per second is the basic SI unit. So I'm going to put it in that exact unit, 116. Okay, so with all those, the number I get is 6301. Um, so this should be in basic SI unit, so Joe. Let's uh, just uh, give it a try, see if that's the correct answer first. And yeah, it's the correct answer. I just didn't really have a big that. And let me show you, um, give you an alternate scenario. What if the table of rotational inertia you are looking up isn't as complete as this list? You know, this list has uh, uh, 10 different geometries. What if the list you're looking at has smaller set of geometries. I can imagine this not being given on some of the tables of rotation inertia. What if you have that? That is the scenario where the approach I'm going to describe is going to be very useful to help you make use of the knowledge that you already have. Because, um, so even though this geometry is not quite as common, so you can imagine that not being present in some of the tables you might look up, I would tell you the rotational inertia of a solid disk. It's one you can rely on having uh, either on a table of rotational inertias or, you know, frankly, this is one you should have memorized. That would have been my recommendation, you know, memorize rotational inertia for a solid disk so that when you have a question like this one, you can use the approach that I'm going to describe. So you are looking at this uh, object where um, it's a donut or annulus or uh, whatever. Uh, it's a, a combination of two circles, basically. There's an outer circle, there's an inner circle, and inner circle is the whole. And as you look at it, if this uh, was made instead of two parts, then you could describe it in terms of a solid cylinder of a cylindrical axis. So the two parts one wishes, uh, one could describe this as, is this part of radius R2 uh, that is a solid disk. So one that's just completely filled from radius equals zero to radius outer end. And Somehow, if you could subtract off a smaller circle or smaller disk of radius R1 that is also solid and has the same density as the bigger disk, then that would give you this shape. And what I'm here to tell you is, yes, you can do that. And, uh, and I guess uh, if uh, the fact that you can do that makes intuitive sense to you, then great. Go ahead and use it. I've told you you can do it. Go ahead and do it. Uh, somehow, if you need a, a justification why this should be possible, the justification I would cite is something called the superposition principle. This is something you are going to see more in the future. Um, in your math class, potentially, in your linear algebra class, and in future physics and engineering classes. This is a, this is a principle that holds, um, let me describe it this way, uh, holds with linear systems. 
and I will um, leave the more precise definition of what linear means to your math class and future physics and engineering classes. Um, for the purpose of this question and for our purposes right now, we'll just say we are going to use the superposition principle to derive the rotational inertia of the wheel. So we'll say rotational inertia of the wheel is going to be rotational inertia of, uh, let me call this 2, minus rotational inertia of this piece 1. So I2 minus I1, by which we would mean using this formula here. And, and being careful that the mass that is referred to here is the mass of the object. So I got to give it symbols to make sure I won't accidentally write down the wrong thing. So this has mass m2, and this is going to have mass m1. So the combined rotational inertia would be uh, 1 half, that's the 1 half there, mass 2 times r2 squared minus 1 half m1 r1 squared, okay? And if you're looking at this uh, minus sign here, and you're looking at that plus sign we had before, and if that uh, makes you worry, don't worry. Let's uh, just continue through the derivation because we're not quite yet done. For one, um, we have too many unknowns. We got these unknowns M2 and M1. And frankly, the information that's given to us, it's neither of those. We are given the mass of the wheel, which is uh, mass of the wheel. So let me call the capital M which I guess uh, thinking through this superposition principle, it would be really M2 minus M1. So, okay. Um, so let me, let's uh, think of a way to write this out. So for this uh, superposition principle to hold, really what we need to be able to say is we need to be able to say that for these both of these objects, densities are the same. Which, um, so we haven't, technically cover the densities yet, but I think uh, you can get some intuitive sense of uh, what we are going to use as our operational definition of density for this question as being the total mass, for example, M2, divided by the total area. So that would be uh, pi r2 squared. So what we are saying is this is same as M1 divided by pi r1 squared. Okay, so we do this expression. Let's do this. Um, I'm going to see if I can... Um, let's try eliminating m1 and see, see what that does. Um, so solving this for m1, I have um, pi's cancel. Good. <laughs> um, m1 is equal to r1 squared over r2 squared times m2. Okay, let me plug that in. Then I have an expression for rotational inertia of the wheel of one half times um, m2. R, right, this one doesn't change. Minus, and here it. Uh, uh, let me do a little bit of simplification as we go. So I'm gonna plug in m2, so it'll be minus one half m2 times. And, oh wait, I can't simplify, never mind. So it's going to be r1 squared over r2 squared times r1 squared. All right, um, okay. Now uh, we are not given the m2. Um, what we are really given is the mass m here. So let me see if I can, um, somehow simplify this down so that our expression here is going to be in terms of m. I think I can do the same thing I did here by plugging in mass m1 here. So plugging in the expression for m1 up to here, I have m2 times, and I'm gonna imagine factoring out m2, then I have one minus an r1 squared over r2 squared. All right. Um, let me see. So solving this for solving this expression for M2, this is what I'm going to have. I'm going to have 
m2 is equal to total mass m of the wheel divided by 1 minus r1 squared over r2 squared. Just scroll up to double check. Yeah. Damage. Good. So, all right. Let me plug this in and just let's see what comes out. Maybe something good will happen. Maybe no, nothing good will happen. <laughs> we'll see. So, rotational inertia of the wheel is... Um, let me just factor out some of the common... Do I want to factor out? Yeah, let me do some um, intermediate simplification. I can see that one half is in all the terms. So I'm going to factor that out, one half. And I see M2 is in both the terms. So I'm going to factor it out first and then substitute this in. So it's going to be M divided by 1 minus R1 squared over R2 squared times and the rest of the stuff that didn't get factored out that's going to be r2 squared minus r1 um, r1 to the fourth power um, let me not write it that way um, let's see let me try writing r1 squared times another r1 squared over r2 squared hmm all right, uh, let me do this uh, simplification. Um, I don't like seeing all these nested uh, fractions, you know, fraction of fraction. So one way you can get rid of the nested fraction is by doing this, by multiplying on the, everything on the numerator by r2 squared and everything on the denominator by another r2 squared. Um, then um, on the just to writing out the, um, the whole fraction thing all over so i have uh, so this is a, a this ratio is one that's why i can do it because it doesn't actually change any quantity so multiplying this in um, so i can absorb this factor into one of the two parentheses so i can absorb this into here so then I'll have one half mass divided by R2 squared minus R1 squared times. And I can observe this numerator thing into here, which will give me R2 to the fourth power. Uh, okay, okay. I think it's going to work out. Okay. Minus, I have R1 to the fourth power. And normally so this r2 squared it's getting distributed into these two terms and the r2 squared getting multiplied to the second term it cancels out this denominator so so I, i'm good i think uh, this is it so if you want you can end the things here this is your expression for rotational inertia and we can see how the um, how the overall answer works out with this expression for rotational inertia Let's just uh, make sure that numerically this is correct. So my rotational kinetic energy, uh, we'll say it's the, the value of the rotational inertia here, which will be uh, one half. We, no, the, that was one half from one half um, in the kinetic energy formula. Uh, what's in the rotational inertia formula is everything here. So let's say one half times mass divided by our to squared minus r1 squared uh, times r2 to the fourth power minus r1 to the fourth power. Okay, that's all over rotation inertia. And if we, uh, let, and let me just uh, display kinetic energy expression to make sure I actually changed it. And then when I substitute in these same values, you'll see that it's the same number. So, so this is the correct expression. Um, if you want to leave things here, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to simplify it. But one thing I would uh, recommend that you get into practice of doing is doing the kind of algebra that I'm going to show. This actually simplifies and uh, it relies on you recognizing um, a particular factoring form, which is that if you have a squared minus b squared, it factors into this form, a plus b, parenthesis, times a minus b. So I'm, I'm looking at this expression here. 
because I, if I can say a is equal to r2 squared and b is equal to r1 squared, then we can use this factoring form. And after we've done the factoring, I'm looking forward to getting this canceled out. So let me just write it out. I have one half, uh, one in the front that doesn't change, times, now this expression factored out using this factoring formula. R2 squared plus R1 squared times R2 squared minus R1 squared. Now, this R2 squared minus R1 squared, it occurs here and here. So they cancel out. And this is how they got that um, weird addition of radii squared in the textbook formula. So, yeah. Um, so I, I guess uh, if for no other reason, that it would be one reason to try this out because it will uh, show you the derivation of the textbook formula. So, so that's it. That's it, this question. Um, depending on how you approach it, it can be super quick, just the way I did by looking at formula from textbook. But, you know, I, I would really recommend um, trying this approach as a way of kind of learning how to do this kind of question with not quite as much help from the formulas you would look up, uh, which is the approach I've taken here, just to use the basic knowledge of rotational inertia of a disk, and the rest comes from the superposition principle, which is a very general principle that you are going to see many, many times in your physics and engineering education.